Good evening and welcome to our Ash Wednesday worship service. Uh, as a reminder, this is a service of communion. So I invite you to find something around the house, something that will stand in for the bread and the cup, and have those ready for later on in our service where we celebrate the Lord's Supper. This will also be a service where we impose the ashes on each other's foreheads, and of course, we're not together to do that this year. So we invite you to do that at home. We provided at-home ashes, so um, have those ready for later on in our service as well. Let us worship God. O Lord, open my lips. And my mouth shall declare your praise. The sacrifice you accept, O God, is a humble spirit. A broken and contrite heart you will not turn away. Let us pray. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover our perfect peace, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from Isaiah chapter 58, beginning at verse 1. Listen now for the word of God. Shout out, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, 
a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness, and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. Uh, chapters 5 and 6. St. Paul writes, So, we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For God says, At an acceptable time, I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation, I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commanded ourselves in every way, through great endurance and afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known as dying and see we are alive as punished and yet not killed as sorrowful yet always rejoicing as poor yet making many rich as having nothing and yet possessing everything the word of the lord
In the book, To Dance with God, Gertrude Moller Nelson tells of a time when she was working hard on a sewing project. Her daughter, Anika, who was three years old at the time, found her and began picking through all of her fabric, choosing colorful strips which she took with her when she left the room. After a while, Gertrude decided to check on her daughter. She found her in the garden, sitting on the grass with a long pole. With as much tape as she could manage, she was taping the strips of fabric to the pole. Look, Mommy, she exclaimed, I'm making a banner for a processional. 
I need a procession so that God will come down and dance with us. And she stood up and began to dance, twirling the pole all around her. Our relationship with God as a child is one of wonder. We want to know how it is that God can be everywhere. We want to know what really happened when God created the earth. We are grateful for what we have and content to be in the present moment. But somewhere along the way, our relationship with God becomes more complicated as our very lives become more complicated. We question God's motives, doubt our own gifts, wonder what the bigger plan is, or even if there is a bigger plan at all. And we begin to question what God would want to do with us at all. I know so many people, including myself, who have convinced themselves that God will not act on our behalf. And therefore, we need to do for ourselves. We are gifted at relying on our own acts. We are gifted at relying on our own plans, our own schedules. There have been far too many times throughout our lives where we've questioned the actions or lack of actions of God. I remember in December 2012, when the tragedy at the elementary school in Newtown, Connecticut happened. And I was talking to a pastoral colleague of mine and reflecting on what this means for Christians. And my colleague was very willing to have the conversation, yet what he said shocked me. He said that after witnessing the horror of the Newtown shootings, he could come to only three conclusions about God. His first conclusion was, God does not exist. His second conclusion was, God exists, yet God does not care to intervene in the lives of God's people. And his third conclusion, which to me was the most troubling, was this. God exists. God cares about everything that happens to God's people. Yet, God is powerless to do anything about it. That was the first time I ever heard someone articulate a struggle with God that way. Oh, anyone can say God does not exist. Anyone can say God refuses to intervene. But as Christians, it is heartbreaking to comprehend a God who wants to do something about the suffering in the world and is unable to do something about the suffering in the world. To comprehend a God who sees death all around, yet can do nothing to alleviate our pain.
tonight, Ash Wednesday, in the midst of our selfishness, in the midst of our desire to be in control of our own lives, we come to be reminded of who we are. That first and foremost, we are children of God. We are invited to bring our whole selves, like the hokey pokey, we bring our whole selves into this relationship with God who loves our whole selves, not just the parts that we want to reveal or the parts that we think are the prettiest or the parts we are willing to share with other people. In the midst of our pain, in the midst of our heartbreak, on Ash Wednesday, God invites us to bring our whole selves, especially that part of ourself that denies our mortality, to face our mortality, to remember we are limited creatures whose life on earth comes to an end, is to realize that no matter how much we exercise and eat healthy food, we cannot avoid death. As unfair as it may seem, like it or not, death is inevitable. We don't need a reminder of that this Ash Wednesday. For the last 11 months, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen far too many people die. Almost half a million Americans have died of COVID-19. More Americans have died of COVID-19 than died in the Second World War. We have all lost people we have cared about. Our congregations, Drayden, Greenfield, and Cana, have lost people very dear to our three faith communities. In addition to the folks we have lost to death, far too many people in our congregations, far too many people in our communities have faced unbelievable economic hardship as our government, in an attempt to protect people, has shut our economy down from time to time, which has disproportionately affected those in the service industry, those who had little to no savings. Yes, death is inevitable. Some of us might be working out more than we ever have before in the past year in hopes of keeping the effects of COVID-19 at bay. But when we're honest with ourselves, we know that either tomorrow, next week, or in 90 years, death is going to be our reality. On this night, when we are called by the Holy Spirit to focus on the inevitable nature of death, we are called to remember the witness of people like Dr. Jeffrey Tyler. Dr. Tyler was a surgeon dying of cancer, who angered his wife when he announced he planned to build his own pine coffin. His friends also misunderstood his decision, interpreting it as a sign he was giving up on life. But in fact, building his own coffin helped Dr. Piler live more fully and put things in proper perspective. Dr. Piler, in an interview with the New York Times, said, It's pretty much impossible to feel angry at someone 
for driving too slowly in front of you in traffic when you have just come from sanding your own coffin. Remembering that we are mortal human beings can help put things in proper perspective and hopefully also motivate us to live the days we do have more fully. There is an additional reason for our remembering. The phrase, you are dust, and to dust you shall return, is stated in the Bible in Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. God speaks these words to Adam and Eve after they have been disobedient. Their disobedience was motivated by their desire to know all that God knew. Our disobedience is similar. We want to be in control, in charge of our own lives, in charge of our own health. In other words, we want to be God. We are not God. We are creatures whom God has made, whose existence and very breath depends on our Creator. We live and we die all at the hands of God. We constantly try to deny death, especially during a deadly pandemic. We idolize youthfulness. We try to prevent or cover up the effects of aging. We drive ourselves to leave a legacy we seek to fill the emptiness inside or smother our fears that come when we let the reality of death come near. We yearn for something more, more money, more vaccines, more adventures, more beauty, more success, more security, more friends, more food. Pastor, Barbara Brown Taylor calls whatever we use to comfort ourselves, to block our pain and fear, our pacifiers. She says, whenever we start feeling too empty inside, we stick our pacifiers into our mouths and suck for all we are worth. They do not nourish us, but at least they plug the hole. Barbara Brown Taylor goes on to say, that hollowness we sometimes feel is not a sign of something gone wrong. It is the holy of holies inside of us, the uncluttered throne room of the Lord our God. In tonight's scripture reading, from 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul and his comrades knew firsthand what life was like without any comforts but God. They suffered from afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 4 through 5. And yet they endured and proclaimed that now is the day of salvation. Paul says, we are treated as impostors, and yet are true, as unknown, and yet are well known. As dying and see, we are alive, as punished, and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing everything. What is the everything Paul possessed? What allowed them to rejoice in the midst of life's frailty and suffering? It was the gift of God's grace. It was their hope in God's promise of eternal life. It was their assurance that nothing could separate them from God's love. It was the joy that comes and can only come from uniting our lives with Jesus Christ. This Lenten season, as we journey together during these 40 days in the midst of a pandemic where inequity is all around us, where death is all around us, we are tempted to ponder the questions of my Lutheran pastor friend from Wisconsin. Does God exist? If God exists, does God care at all about us? 
And if God cares at all about us, can God do something about it? But in the midst of our questioning, let us be open to our vulnerabilities. Let us remember that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. Amen. friends in Christ, at the time of the Christian Passover, we celebrate our deliverance from sin and death through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lent is the season of preparation for this great celebration. Lent is a journey that prepares us for renewal and transformation. Lent is about being honest. It's being honest with ourselves for the many ways that we have sinned. It's being honest about all of the things that are broken in our own lives. We examine closely the ways that we have harmed not only ourselves, but also others. By being honest about these things, we open ourselves up to the one whose love is boundaryless and limitless. We make space in our hearts and in our lives for the one who showed overflowing mercy and grace in the life of Jesus, who we proclaim and worship as the Christ. This journey begins tonight with a sign of ashes, a reminder not only of our own frailty and need of for God, but also of the God who breathes new life into the dust and ashes. So let us prepare ourselves by praying together responsively our litany of penitence. 
God of our completeness. We give thanks for the gift of life. We see the world around us, all you have created, and at times we are in awe of its beauty. God of our wholeness, we give you thanks for the, light, the gift of love. We reflect on the life of Jesus, who promises rest, and at times we are ready to follow. O God of our entire being, we give thanks for the gift of sustaining nourishment. We catch glimpses of your spirit moving among us, and at times we are ready to receive. God, your love is unconditional. Forgive our conditions. You created us in your image, and you long for us to share our life together. But we're more interested in our own life. You long for us to have compassion for one another. But we're more interested in my own needs. You long for us to peacefully listen to one another. But we're more interested in our own opinions. God, your love is unconditional. Forgive our conditions. You draw us together and you call us to be your church. To be your light shining in the shadows. To be your salt seasoning a sapless society. You envision the community we call the church to be a reflection of life as you intend for all creation. But we're more interested in deciding who's in and who's out, who's right and who's wrong, who's a Christian and who's not, who belongs at your table and who doesn't. God, your love is unconditional. Forgive our conditions. You see in us a potential that is beyond our imaginations. We see the comfort of the status quo. During this season, you call us to a place of renewal. We know that renewal is code for change. We don't like change. Most of the time. But deep down, we long for your renewal. We need your renewal. We welcome your renewal. So forgive us, transform us, and renew us. Amen. As we enter this holy season of Lent, these ashes serve as a reminder to us of our mortality as creatures whom God has created in God's own image. They also serve as a reminder to us of our penitence as a faith community and our need to confess our sin and to live more fully into the life that God intends for all of us. So at this time, I invite you at home to take your ashes, which hopefully you have mixed with some olive oil by now, and then take your thumb and place it in the ashes, and then sign the cross on your forehead, either on your own forehead or on the forehead of loved ones around you, and repeat after me. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. But remember, too, that you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. Amen.
Friends, with the sign of the cross on our foreheads, we remember that this is still the joyful feast of the people of God. At this table, we are practicing and anticipating for the great day that is coming for our world, a day where people will come from north and south and from east and west and from everywhere in between. Those who look and act like us and so many more who don't, and we will all gather together at table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples. He took a piece of bread and, and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples, and then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is indeed Christ's table. This table doesn't belong to me, doesn't belong to Greenfield Presbyterian Church, doesn't belong to Drayton Presbyterian Church, doesn't belong to Cana Lutheran Church. It belongs to Christ. And Christ has invited all and makes a place for all to share in the feast which he has prepared. Let us pray. Creator God, in the beginning you stooped low to the earth and molded us from the dust. You breathed your breath into us and we became living creatures. Filled with your divine and holy breath, we became your image-bearing creation, called to care for the earth, to love one another, and to serve you. But we are dust, and we betrayed your image in ourselves and in others. Instead of stewards of creation, we became exploiters of it. Instead of being neighbors to our fellow human beings, we categorize ourselves and look with suspicion and enmity towards those we call the other. Rather than serving you, we sought our own desires. We are dust. But we know, God, that you love the dust. We know you are always ready to create something new from the dust and the ashes. In Jesus Christ, you transformed our dusty selves into new creations. Through his death and resurrection, we know we are not abandoned to the dust, but you have promised new life with you. 
So, Holy Spirit, breathe now once again into our dusty souls. Use the gifts of this table to nourish us and sustain us. Unite us together in carrying forward the ministry of Jesus Christ. And until he returns, we pray together as he taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, and the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. On the last night of his life, our Lord Jesus Christ sat together with his disciples around a table, celebrating a meal of liberation and freedom. And taking the bread, he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. As often as you eat bread, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And pouring into it, he said, This is the cup of the new covenant, the new relationship with God made possible by the shedding of my blood. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. Friends, whenever we celebrate communion, I always invite you to come forward and to tear off a piece of bread that is as big as you understand God's grace to be, and then take just a little bit more. Because with God, there is always, always more than enough. And just because you might need a lot of grace today doesn't mean there's not enough left for somebody else. So whatever is serving as communion for you tonight, I pray that you're using it generously and abundantly because our God has been exceedingly generous and abundant with us. So taking the bread, we remember Christ's body that was broken not only for us, but for all people. Take and receive with gladness. And taking the cup, Remember Christ's blood that was shed and poured out for us and for all people. Take and receive with gladness. Let us pray. O God, send us out from our Lord's table to answer his summons into new life and to follow him with joy and gladness. Set our feet in his way that our lives may be signs of his life and that all we do may show forth his love. Amen.
My friends, our 40-day journey with God and with one another is set to begin. In the 40 days between now and Easter Sunday, it is my prayer and hope that your faith and possibilities increases, your willingness to engage opportunity increases, and your love for family and friends grows deeper. God is with us. God is for us. Let us depart in peace. Amen. Thank you.